then let's go ahead and one second yes if there are no questions from last week then let's go ahead and begin the class we are going to do part two of the bible and it's all this i think this is the last part that we are we are, we are borrowing from this series that i'm working on and then we go back to we the north because we would have built the foundation to tackle the exodus tradition as the north uh, knew it or how they narrated it um today what i want to do is to demonstrate um the sources that i mentioned um, to demonstrate how it works what it looks like and to show you how the narratives will change when we do the needful so um, buckle up it may be new territory for some people um, so just be a little attentive and then i think we would be in a very good place i'm excited for this class today in school this was my favorite part of the study you see why so let's begin our class Last week, we mentioned about um, three people who were instrumental in discovering these sources that we mentioned, the JEPD. Um, the first was a German minister, Witter, Bernhard, or what we say Bernhard now, but Bernhard Witter. Um, he was the first one um, to actually point this out. Um, he made this discovery in 1711. This is when the discovery was made. But what happened was his book made very little impact and was in fact forgotten um, until it was rediscovered two centuries later in the 1900s, 1924 to be specific. So he was the first one. Okay. Then the second one was Jean Astruc. We saw him yes, um, last week. Um, this was a French professor of medicine and he was in the court of Louise, um, the, let's see, X, XV is 10 and then five, the 15th. And um, he published his findings at the age of 70. And he did this anonymously first in Brussels, and then he did it secretly in Paris in 1753. His book too made very little impression on anyone. Why is that? Um, some actually belittled it because, you know, he was not a scholar. He was a medical doctor. So people did not really pay attention to what he's got to say. As usual, we have a society that you have to have all these degrees and titles before you listen to. <laughs> um, that has changed um, 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 very much. But yes, he did not get that traction as well. But the third person who noticed this JEPD, who noticed, sorry, let me correct that, who noticed that there are multiple authors um, when it came to the Torah of Moses, and also made a publication, was Johann, Johann Hickhorn. Why did he make an impact? Because he was a known, respectable scholar. He was respected. And also, he was a son of a pastor. When he published, it got people's attention. His discovery, which had been discovered by two other people, um, lasted only 18 years. And then there were further discoveries that the Torah was actually written by four writers. So this is a brief history about how we got here. From last week, they discovered that E 
had another source hidden in it. Okay? So we had a JEPD, but within E, there was another source hidden in it. They noticed that within the group of stories that called the deity Elohim, there were still doublets. They also noticed differences of style, differences of language, and differences of interests that E did not have. So you take the J and E, and then you look at E, you notice that there's still some um, um, texts or narratives that stand out. You know, their language is different. Their concerns is different. Their style of writing is different. And this third set of stories seem to be particularly interested in priests. This is where we get the P. Just recap from last week. So J, E, and P were found to flow through the first four of the five books of Moses. Yeah. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. However, there was hardly a trace of them in the fifth book, which is Deuteronomy, except for a few lines in the last chapter. Okay. Now, Deuteronomy is written in an entirely different style from those of the other four books. That's what they found out. The differences are obvious, even in translation. In Deuteronomy, the vocabulary is different. There are some favorite expressions which are recurrent. You, you see that all the time in Deuteronomy. You don't see it in any of the other four books. There are doublets of whole sections of the first four books in the book of Deuteronomy. Now, there are blatant contradictions of details between it and the others. When you look at the Ten Commandments, you notice that the one in Deuteronomy is not the same as the one in Exodus. No. So even part of the wording of the Ten Commandments is different. So Deuteronomy appeared to be an independent source, a fourth one, and that was what was called D. Now, I don't see this as a big deal. This should not be a big deal. Why is that? After all, we have four Gospels in the New Testament, and we have four different writers of the Torah. So big deal, J-E-P-D, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Why should we make a big deal out of it? Why was it so difficult for people to accept it? The difference was that the Hebrew Bible had been accepted as Moshe's own writing for so long, about 2,000 years. The Gospels, we know that different writers wrote it. The Torah, the tradition was that Moshe wrote it. So to find out that there are actually four different hands was a big deal. What was happening was that new discoveries we're now flying in the face of an old, accepted, sacred tradition. That's the pushback. So those who were inspecting, what they were doing was that they were unraveling a finely woven garment. And no one knew where these investigations would lead. This was where the push is coming from. Okay, we've accepted, we've pushed this tradition that Moshe wrote it. Shabbat Shalom, Madam Felix and Mr. Tom. Moshe wrote this. Now we find out that no, they actually four different hands. Moshe did not even have a hand in it. How do you prevent this? 
to people who have accepted for so long that it was penned by Moshe. But what we had was a finely woven garment. And our job today is to pull the garments apart and then see what J had to say. See what E had to say. See what P had to say. See what D had to say. Like I always say, don't read the synaptic gospels as one person wrote it. No, we cannot do that. We shouldn't do that too. When we're doing what we call high criticism, we shouldn't do that too with the gospels. Most people haven't seen what we're going to look at. Most people don't know it even exists. Um, but it's always good to find out something new. So we're going to start with Noah and the blood. What are we going to do? We're going to take Genesis chapter 6, chapter 7, chapters 8. We're going to take the narrative and then we're going to pull apart the sources. And then we want to find out where it would lead us. That's what we're going to do today. We're going to pull out the sources from these three chapters. We're going to identify what J said, what P said, what E said, what D said, and then what the redactor put in to join these things together. Awesome. Before we start, any questions, comments, anything you missed before we start this beautiful, beautiful session? Madam Pamela, Shabbat Shalom to you. Madam Tracy, Shabbat Shalom to you as well. <laughs> Mr. Jason says I'm fancy today. <laughs> Awesome. So if there are no comments, if, uh, I'm hoping that that means that we are all comfortable. Um, we are on the same page. If that is the case, let's do this. What do we know about Noah and the Flood when it comes to higher criticism? Anytime I say higher criticism, I'm talking about the JEPD. Okay. The Flood is a combination of the J source and then the P source. That is what we have when we're looking at Noah and the blood. What you should know is that each account has its own vocabulary and concerns. When I take the J source and I just read only the J source, what the J wrote, and then I take the P source and I read the P source, I would notice that they use different vocabularies. Their concerns are different. It is extremely important. Now, let me explain this. If you look at the bottom of the chapter, I have some indications there. What I have highlighted in pink is the J source. What I've highlighted in green is the P source. Now, when I say we are reading the J source, we're not going to read anything highlighted in green. We just follow the pink highlights. When I say we're reading the P source, I'm just reading what is highlighted in green. I'm not going to concern myself with the pink. Are we clear on that? It is important. So you follow when I'm reading it. Rabbi? Mr. Jason. The P source is the priestly source, right? So they typically like... Uh... Uh, genealogies, correct? Correct. Okay, there. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Yes. Okay. Awesome. We on the same page? Let's go for it. Okay. Another statement. There were no chapters. We have chapters now. So you would notice that we'll go from chapter six, we we'll go to chapter seven, we we'll go to chapters eight. One big story. The chapters were put in just to divide it. No. So don't worry about the chapters. Let's just follow the highlights. Okay. I'm going to start with 
reading the J source, meaning that I'm not going to bother myself with anything in green. I'm going to pay attention to um, the concept of God that they have. I'm going to pay attention to um, their language, um, certain details. And we come back and we read the, the priestly source. Okay, so let's start from Genesis 6. We read in the P, sorry, we read in the J source. The J source is what uses Elam, Yudhevahe, Yahweh, most of the time. So let's begin. And Yudhevahe saw that the evil of man was great in the earth. And every imagination of his heart was only evil all the time. And you'd hear that he regretted that he had made man upon the earth. And he became grieved in his heart. And you'd hear that he said, I will bloat out man whom I created from upon the face of the earth, from man to cattle, to creeping thing, to the fowl of the heavens. For I regret that I made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of yud -Hey -Vav -Hey. I'm going to pause here. Let me read verses 9, which is the peace source, and ask you a question. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man. He was perfect in his generation. Noah walked with Elohim. With the separation that I have made, does the peace source flow well, sorry, does the J source flow well into the P source? Or you can see the separation. Rabbi, you can see it clearly though, like I can. Um, okay. There's definitely a separation because why, why would you have to go back and then talk about <laughs> Noah's generations? That's it. When you are already talking about that these people did evil in the sight of the Lord. I don't care what happened in his generation because you already told me in his generation that these people did evil but Correct. you can see it oh wow that's that's interesting see it, it doesn't flow you will not notice it doesn't flow till you're exposed to the jepd and you know which one is j which one is p which one is e and you've separated them okay that's good awesome Looks like you're following. I'm going to start reading from verses five again, and then this time just read, chase the P source. And you have always saw that the evil of man was great in the earth, and every imagination of his heart was only evil all the time. And you have always regretted that he had made man upon the earth, and he became grieved in his heart. And you'd hear about his said, I will bloat out man whom I created from upon the face of the earth, from man to cattle to creeping thing, to the fowl of the heavens, for I regret that I made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of you'd hear about hey. Have to go to Genesis 7 1. And you'd hear about hey said to Noah, Do you understand what we've just done? The continuation of Genesis 6, the story after verses 8, it continues as Genesis 7, 1. Okay. So, but Noah found favor in the eyes of yud heh -Vav -Heh, And yud heh -Vav -Heh said to Noah, come into the ark, you and all your household. For it is you that I have seen as a righteous man before me in this generation. Of all the clean animals, you shall take for yourself seven pairs, a male and its mate. And of the animals that you and, and of the animals that are not clean, two, a male and its mate. Look at the language that J is using, a male and its mate. Also, of the fowl of the heavens, seven pairs, male and female, to keep seed alive on the face of the earth. For in another seven days, I will make it rain upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. And I will bloat out all beings that I have made of the face of the earth. And Noah did according to all that Yudhe Vavhe had commanded him. Verse 7, 
And Noah went in and his sons and his wife and his son's wife with him into the ark because of the flood waters. Verses 10. And it came to pass after the seven days that the flood waters were upon the earth. 12. And the rain was upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. And as Elohim had, or, or, and as God had commanded him, and Yudhevave shut him in. And the flood was 40 days upon the earth, and the waters increased, and they lifted the ark, and it rose of the earth, and the waters became powerful, and they increased very much upon the earth. And the ark moved upon the waters, and the waters became exceedingly powerful upon the earth. And all the lofty mountains that were under the heavens were covered up. Fifteen cubits above did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered up. Everything that had the breath, that's 22, of the spirit of life in its nostrils, of all that were on the dry land, they died. Put that in a spirit. They died. J uses die. And it, that is the flood, bloated out all beings that were upon the face of the earth man to animal to creep and thing and to the fowl of the heavens and they were bloated out from the earth and only Noah and those with him in the ark survived let's go on and the windows of the heavens and the rain from the heavens were withheld and the waters receded of the earth more and more verse 6 and it came to pass at the end of 40 days, that Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made. Eight. And he sent forth a dove from with him to see whether the waters had abated from upon the surface of the earth. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of its feet. So it returned to him to the ark because there was water upon the entire surface of the earth. So he stretched forth his hand and took it, and he brought it to him into the ark. And he, and he waited again another seven days, and he again sent for the dove from the ark. And the dove returned to him at eventide. And behold, it had plucked an olive leaf in its mouth. So no one knew that the water had abated from upon the earth. And he again waited another seven days, and he sent for the dove. And it did no and, and it did no longer continue to return to him. And Noah removed the covering of the ark, and he saw, and behold, the surface of the ground had dried up. This is 20. And Noah built an altar to Yudhevave, and he took of all the clean animals, and of all the clean fowl, and brought a burnt offering on the altar. And Yudhevave smelled the pleasant aroma. And Yudhevave said to himself, I would no longer curse the earth because of man, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, and I will no longer smite all living things as I have done. So long as the earth exists, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. This is the J source for Noah and his ark. Okay. Any questions on that before I read the P source? And then I'll show you differences. Rabbi. Mr. Drew. Well, since we're doing uh, 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 high criticism, uh, the question I have to ask is, if God told you to get in the ark, right? I'm just saying, you know, if God told you to get in the ark, why wouldn't God tell you hey, uh, he, uh, that the water's low or the water's high? Don't even worry about sending out a dove or whatever. I'll let you know when you come out. I'll let you know when you come out. You know what I'm saying? He told me to get in the ark. You know what I'm saying? Shut me in. You shut me in. You shut the door. And then, but you don't talk to me. You don't open the door back up. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You don't open, don't open the door. I didn't say open the door. You know what I mean? And another thing, it's like if I'm if I'm in the uh, in the water. You know, I'm just saying. You know, if I'm in the water, out to sea. You know, I was a sailor for 20 years, so I'm like, you know, I'm out to sea. 
and I'm just floating. I'm uh, DIW, dead in the water, really. I'm dead in the water. I'm just floating. And then what happened is, how come God's not talking to him? You know, you, you feel me what I'm saying? It's like you just sitting there for six months. That's six months. You know, 180 days is six months. So you went on a, that was the first recorded uh, uh, cruise in the Bible. You, you feel me what I'm saying? So I'm like, okay. It, 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 it seems crazy, you know. The story seems crazy that okay, the only time God talks to you is when you offer a sacrifice. Was you praying the whole time? I mean, I mean that, you know, that's it. That's, that's just a sidebar. So. Correct. Very, very good. Very good observation. Now all these questions come up, and because now we're pulling it apart, our criticism, we're looking at the sources, and you're forced to ask these questions. Um, Rabbi, it flows so well, though. Definitely. <laughs> like, like when you split it up this way, it flows well. Because, like, as you were reading, I'm trying to read the green afterwards. <laughs> and I'm like, yo, this don't make no sense. Right. <laughs> but, like, first, you know, you think, you know, you, you don't you don't see these things. But it really doesn't make no sense. Because right. one source is saying this. And then, like, it, when you pull it apart. The other source is saying a whole different, like a, a whole different thing. Is it a dove? Is it a raven? Correct. Right? Is it 40 days? Is it is it 300 <laughs> days? Like, which is it? It can't be both of them. But, but you wouldn't catch none of this had you not pulled this apart. Awesome. Awesome. Yes. That's beautiful. Um, Mr. Mark says, so the peace sources use Elohim. Yes, sir. Yes, it uses Elohim uh, majority of the time. It may use um, you'd have here as well, but majority uses Elohim. Okay, um, Madam Pamela says, "What was Jay's purpose? Philosophy? Awesome. We'll answer that question. We have to answer what is going on. J and E, J and P. What is going on? Beautiful, beautiful questions." Um, And Jay, the ark was built already. Correct, Mr. Mark. Thanks for noticing that. With Jay, there's no building of an ark. Just went into, um, found, didn't, Noah found favor, finds favor in the eyes of Yah. Yah tells him to enter the ark. He don't have the building of the ark. Awesome. Beautiful. I'm, I'm liking this. Now, let's read the P source. So the peace source is going to tell us its own narrative about the Noah's Ark. The peace source narrative about Noah's Ark is not Jay's source's narrative. Two different narratives. Vocabulary is different. Their concerns is different. These are the generations of Noah. I'm reading the green, those who just joined us. I'm reading the green. I'm not paying attention to the pink highlights. That is a J source. I'm reading the peace source here, the priestly source. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man. He was perfect in his generation. Noah walked with Elohim. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. P is very particular about genealogy, generations. So that's what we have here. Now the earth was corrupt because Elohim, corrupt before Elohim, and the earth became full of robbery. And Elohim saw the earth, and behold, it had become corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted its way on the earth. And Elohim said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth has become full of robbery because of them. And behold, I am destroying them from the earth. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. You shall make the ark with compartments, and you shall chop it both inside and outside with pitch. And this is the size you shall make it, 300 cubits, the length of the ark, 50 cubits, its breadth, and 30 cubits, its height. You shall make a skylight for the ark, and to a cubit you shall finish it up, no, finish it to the top. In the entrance of the ark, you shall place it, you shall place in its side. You shall make it with bottom compartment, second story compartment and third story compartments. And I, behold, I will bring the flood, water upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which there is the spirit of life from beneath the heavens. All that is upon the earth will perish. 
Hey, and I will set up my covenant with you. P likes covenant. And you shall come into the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your son's wives with you. And of all living things, of all flesh, two of each, you shall bring into the ark to preserve life or to preserve a life with you. They shall be male and female. Of the fowl after its kind and of the animals after their kind, of every creeping thing upon the ground after its kind, two of each shall come to you to preserve a life. And you take for yourself of every food that is eaten and gather it into you, and it shall be for you and for them to eat. And Noah did according to all that Elohim had commanded him. So he did. Beautiful. Of the clean beast, verse 8, and of the beasts that are not clean, and of the fowl, and all, the, and all that creeps upon the earth, two by two they came to Noah to the ark, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. See how it flows perfectly. 11. In the 600 year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, On this day, all the springs of the great deep were split, and the windows of the heavens opened up. 13. On this very day, Noah came, and Shem, and Ham, and Japheth, Noah's sons, and Noah's wife, and his sons, and his sons' three wives, with them into the ark. They and every beast after its kind, and every domestic animal after its kind, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind, and every fowl after its kind, every bird of every wing. And they came to Noah to the ark, two by two, of all flesh in which there is the spirit of life. And those who came, male and female, of all flesh came. 21. And all flesh perished that moved upon the earth, among the fowl, and among the cattle, and among the beast, and among all creeping creatures that creep upon the earth, and all mankind. 24. And the water prevailed upon the earth a hundred and fifty days. <laughs> Interesting. And Elohim remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the cattle that were with him in the ark. And Elohim caused a spirit to pass over the earth, and the waters subsided, and the springs of the deep were closed. And the water diminished at the end of a hundred and fifty days. And the ark came to rest in the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, on the mountain of Ararat. And the waters constantly diminished until the tenth month. In the tenth month, on the first of the month, the mountain peaks appeared. Verse 7. And he sent forth the raven. Mr. Jason's question about the dove. And he sent forth the raven, and it went out back and forth until the waters dried up of the earth. And it came to pass on the 600 and first year, in the first month, on the first of the month that the waters dried up from upon the earth. And in the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth was dry. And Elohim spoke to Noah saying, go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your son's wives with you. Every living thing that is with you of all flesh, of fowl and of animals and of all the creeping things that creep on the earth bring out with you and they shall swarm upon the earth and they shall be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. So Noah went out and his sons and his wives and his son's wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing and all fowl, everything that moves upon the earth, according to their families, they went forth from the ark. Did you see any differences?
in the J narrative and then the P narrative. Bye bye. Mr. Jason. First of all, it's 150 days. Okay. So was it 40 days and 40 nights? Mm -hmm. Or was it 40 days and 40 nights times 2.5? Like, what is it? We got to figure out what's going on with that. Secondly, the P source is obsessed with months and days and like. Correct. Like ritual, ritualistic numbering. Yes. Like you can see that over and over and over. And also too, one cares about gender, the other one doesn't. So Correct. like in the J source, it says male and his mate. That mate could be anything. But in the P source, it says male and female. So it's it's being more gender specific. And then your dove and a raven, which you mentioned already. <laughs> was it dove? Was it raven? Which one was sent? P says it's a raven. J says it's a dove. Anything else anyone picked up before I list? Um, uh, bye bye. Um, yes, um, Madam Masi. And maybe I maybe I'm just seeing things or I'm thinking. But did it rain or did the water rise up from the earth? Correct. So. Um, Let's go back to the question. Um, let's see. Um, with that is from the J source, correct? Um, I think the J source is what, and the waters prevail upon the earth for the P source. doesn't go into details let we from 21 and all flesh perished that moved upon the earth okay and the water prevailed upon the earth now let's go back okay in verses 11 the p says in the 600 year of noah's life in the second month on the 17th day of the month all the springs of the deep were split and the windows of heaven opened up so um i think we have both the deep opening and then the windows of heaven opening up to pour down water. Oh, so the water rose as well as the rain came down. So it was like Correct. from both directions. Correct. Yes, that's what people are telling us. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Rabbi? Madam Malita. I, I saw in verse 19, it says that um, there was only two of every sort. Oh, so nice. <laughs> we read seven. We read other uh, numbers uh, previously. So now we're down to the two. Are we weird? Okay. <laughs> they said two here in, in verse 19. Correct. Uh, also, also, Rabbi, is the, are they, are they in the priestly source, are they uh, answering technical questions? You know what I'm saying? Because like I said, the the uh, the J source didn't give any detail. It just gave you know a brush overview. over overview, and then the pre source is actually giving uh, intricate details. Is that you know is that is that possible? It could be yes, yes. You know how the priests roll. <laughs> right, right, exactly. So, um, God is also anthropomorphic in the J source. Correct. He smells the aroma. He 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 has um, human emotions. Yes, and this what makes perfect sense because um, they found images of Yahweh in the temple, and um, I think it was Samaria, like um, these old um, these little male figurines and stuff. Yes. Um, so this kind of fits with him being anthropomorphic as well, too. Correct. Rabbi. Yes, so, I have a second comment. Are we going to just uh, skim over the Deber and the Nephilim in, in chapter six, or are we going to go there eventually? Uh, I see. Um, I, I saw. I saw how you just kind of rolled right over there. I mean, that, <laughs> that eliminated out of the, the green and pink. So I was wondering, are we going to even, you know, even go there with the uh, with the Nephilim and the 
and, and the diva. Are we going there? Or? Yes, we can. Um, it's not in my notes. What we can do is during the q and A, I I can put it together okay. real quick. I'll show you the sources, color code them, and then we can read them. No problem at all. No. Yes. But I, I didn't put them in my notes. I was focusing on just nowhere. The, the flood, you know. Those great men, um, Madam Alita, come, um, that idea comes from the Anunnaki of Babylon. Um, it's similar. Yeah. These, these great, yeah, these well. are great, powerful means. So you see that creep into um, the Hebrew Bible as well, too, where these angels are taking on humanistic form. And mm -hmm. you see that in like Babylonian and Sumerian literature as well, too. Uh, Mr. Yezayahu, um, he, he's asking whether the R source is included in the P source. Um, no. So when there's an R source, when there's a redactor, I'll paint it as blue. So, no, it's not included in the in the R source. So the redactor is the person who stitched them together. The person who took all the sources and then stitched them together. He, he's the one with with the blue, trying to make it flow. Let's say that. Rabbi. Mr. CJ. I would like for you to give me your thoughts on my uh, inquiry. Could the ravens, could the raven and the dove be keys to like who wrote the text or the origins of the text based on what birds were in what geographic locations? Do you understand what I'm asking? Correct. Yeah. So when you're chasing the author, now we, we, we want to find out, okay. Who wrote it? Yes, that comes into play. You have to look at all these things, the animals being mentioned, geographical places, names, to actually determine who wrote it. Part of this series is actually does that, try to figure out who, who wrote it, not just the sources, um, but where they wrote it at, who wrote it, the time period that it was written, and then when it was redacted. Yeah, you're right. You need all that information too. Um, well, to help you out with that, CJ, <laughs> ravens are not kosher. Doves are. So the doves from the pre-source will be more so of the, the, the priestly realm. And the raven is a localized um I'm trying to think of the, the the place where you find them at a lot. I think it's in the um the desert near Taman is where you find them. The ravens and stuff like that. But the dove is a priestly bird. So that priestly source is why you see the priest, I believe the priestly source is the one that sent out the dove and the raven is from the Yahwistic source. So Any other observations before? But you do understand, you do get the picture of when we say there are two sources and we put them apart. This is what we are talking about. Um, there are a lot of um, famous Bible uh, um, narratives that we're going to look at today and pull it apart. So you get a picture of what is really, 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 really going on. Okay. Madam Pamela, I'm going to answer all your questions and type going to answer all these questions for you. Okay, so this is the summary, what we find out between the J and then the P source. When we read Genesis 6, 7, and 8, we find that the J source uses the term man and woman as in a male and his mate. It would also use male and female, not too much, but it's a male and it's mate, a male and it's mate. That's man and woman. The P source refers to sex of animals with male and female. That's the difference. One says a man and his mate, one says male and female. You will notice that the J source said everything died. The priestly source has a different vocabulary. He says everything expired or perished. So their vocabulary is also different. 
Madame Alita pointed this out. The J source says that it has seven pairs of clean and one pair of unclean animals. The P source has one pair of each kind of animal. So you have a two, male and female. That is the difference between the P and the J source. With the J source, the flood lasted 40 days and 40 nights. When you look carefully at the P source, it lasts a year, 370 days. The J source has concerns, does not have concerns for dates, etc. Mr. Jason mentioned this, but the P source has a concern for dates and ages and measurements. Is very specific. The J source pictures a deity who regrets things he has done. Pictures a deity who can be grieved in his heart. It was the deity that personally closes the ark. The deity smells Noah's sacrifice. So the deity is pictured as having eyes, having nose, uh, has a mouth, has arms. So as Mr. Jason said, P shows an anthropomorphic quality of the deity. It's in P that the deity can regret. So what you, you see here is almost like the Yahweh in Jerusalem, localized. We've, we've dealt with that, so you understand it. But the P source, which I'm not surprised, shows the deity as transcendent, ephemeral, controller of the universe. We, we know this because after um, the kings were off the stage, it was the priests, and now the deity is all over. It's not localized. That's the P source that pushes that theory. So these are the differences, these are the concerns, these are the details that we get from the two different sources when we distinguish them and then we pull them apart. Each source has its own language, its own details, and even its own conception of the deity. Any questions before we move on to the second example? Comments. I hope you're following those who are quiet today. Yeah, the J sources, you could tell is obviously earlier. Than the P source, okay? <laughs> yeah, you could, in this case, it may not be every case, but this specific example, Right. You can tell that this J source tradition was earlier because God is human like. Whereas, you know, right. later in our Bible, he is like in outer space somewhere, like he's not touchable. True. You know, so uh, you could definitely tell that this was a was a um a uh earlier source. And the number 40 is a, a powerful number as well, too. Um I, I know that we like in, in ancient culture 40 was just like a um it, it didn't mean an actual amount of time it was just supposed to meant like a long time ago so yeah awesome so that is the j and the p noah's flood my interest is j and e that is my interest because we need to decipher that so that when we talk about the exodus um tradition that comes from the north, we know uh, what we're dealing with, J and E. Before I go on and show you the examples of the J and E, I want to say this. The J source concerns itself with Judah, and E concerns Israel. Um, Evan Yigba, the R source is the redactor. 
The redactor is the Arab source. The guy who stitched everything together or redacted tried to make the thing flow. That's the R. So J concerns Judah, E concerns Israel. Put that in the back of your mind, put that in your spirit. And then let's look at this. In Genesis 13, this is what we read, 18. And Abraham pitched his tent. Let me say this. If you don't see my statement about the color codes at the bottom, it means that I'm not pulling sources. So this, I'm just reading the text to make a point. When I am distinguishing the different sources, you would see my footnote at the bottom that would state that I'm doing that. So put that in your spread. This is what we read in Genesis 13, 18 about Abraham. And Abraham pitched his tent and he came and he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron. And there he built an altar to yud heh rav -Hey. So where is Abraham staying? Abraham is a J source. Abraham is in Hebron. We're looking at Judah, the territory of Judah. Genesis 18 confirms that. Now yud heh rav -Hey appeared to him in the plains of Mamre, and he was sitting at the entrance of the tent when the day was hot. So the patriarch Abraham, who will be a thousand, a, a, a Judean patriarch, lives in Hebron. Well, Hebron was the capital, was the principal city of Judah, the capital of Judah under King David. So it makes sense that J focuses on Abraham, their patriarch. In the covenant that yud heh vav -He makes with Abraham, he promised that Abraham's descendants will have the land from the river of Egypt until the great river, the Euphrates River. Let's read it, Genesis 15, 18. On that day, yud heh formed a covenant with Abraham, saying, To your seed I have given this land, from the river of Egypt until the great river, the Euphrates River. Why this promise to Abraham, the southern patriarch? Well, these were the nation's boundaries under King David, who would say is the founder or the Judean royal family. These nations were his boundaries. So when the Jesus says this, we know why they are saying it. And these stories are from J, where the deity is referred to as yud heh vav -Hey. So, the sources that focus on, the J sources focus on the territory of Judah. Majority of the time. Okay. The stories that call the deity Elohim, which is the E source, they focus on a different territory. Let's look at the supposed patriarch Jacob of the north. Genesis 32. And Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the break of dawn. When he saw that he could not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip. And the socket of Jacob's hip became dislocated as he wrestled with him. And he, that is the angel, said, Let me go, for dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you have blessed me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob but Israel, because you have commanding power with an angel of Elohim and with men, and you have prevailed. And Jacob asked and said, now tell me your name. And he said, why is it that he asked for my name? And he blessed him there. 
And Jacob named the place Peniel, my daughter's name. For he said, I saw an angel face to face and my soul was saved. So here, Jacob has a face to face fight with someone who turns out to be Elohim or perhaps an angel. And Jacob names the place where it happens Peniel, which means face of God, face of Elohim. Why the name? This is an Esau's. Why is the Esau's focusing on Jacob and telling us about Peniel? Because Peniel is a city that Jeroboam built in the northern kingdom of Israel. Jeroboam here is extremely important when it comes to the Exodus narrative. So the Esau is focusing on the territory of the northern kingdom. We see this in First Kings that yes, Jeroboam built that. And Jeroboam built Shechem in the mountain of Ephraim and lived there. And he went from there and built the city of Peniel. So you would see the focus of the J source, which concerns Judah, and then the E source, which concerns the Northern Kingdom. They all focus on their respective territories. So now Abraham is, is focused predominantly in Judah. Jacob is focused predominantly in the Northern Kingdom. The redactor comes in and then makes Abraham actually come up to the north. That is for another class. But this is the basis, the foundation that we should carry to where we're going. Any questions? Comments. So the So the redactor is how we got, yo. So the redactor is how we got the story of Abraham, of, of Jacob being Abraham's child. Correct. But in reality, Jacob was the bigger one was because big Jacob guy. is from the north. Correct. So it's kind of like, oh my God, I didn't even, yo. Oh my God, I'm sorry. Oh my goodness. No problem. That's why I kept saying that we don't all come from Abraham. No, it's somebody that sticks something together. And they're pushing that, but no, that they is the case. switched it. They like switched the lineage. So you like, like if a person's just reading this, you would think, oh, um, Jacob is the son of Abraham, you know. So therefore, if Abraham's bigger, then that, that gives Judah its its glory, its precedence. But Correct. the reality is, they're not even related. They 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 wove the story together to make it seem that way to make Judah prominent when they actually wasn't. It was correct because they were writing first. So, hey, our page, I think if the North was writing first, they would have made Abraham the son of Jacob. If we were pushing the same theology, which I doubt the North would be pushing this kind of theology. They had a lot of better things doing too easy to push this kind of thing. But yeah, so E focuses on the Northern Kingdom, tell the story from the Northern Kingdom's perspective. J t um, focuses on the South, which is Judah, tells his story. His interest is in Judah or for Judah, concerns Judah. Rabbi, I have a quick question. Yes, but I'm just there. trying. Yeah, I'm just trying to draw a, a, a big picture for myself. And so I have to step back before the redactors. And the way I'm saying is saying this is that um, there was someone writing the E source out there. There was someone writing a J source separately in another location out there. Mm -hmm. And in a third location, perhaps, there was someone writing a P source. And those locations could actually be time periods that they were not all written together. I so if I only, if I only, so just to say, if I only found the E source before they were redacted and put together, would I be reading the story from the Norse perspective only? Or did someone take 
oral history and some scraps of paper that they wrote, sat down and just wrote a bigger story. I'm trying to, you, you understand what I'm trying to get at? Yes, and I would answer that your question shortly today. Beautiful questions, beautiful questions, how you put it, beautiful. And we'll get an answer today of what may be going on here. I'll focus the e source when it was written, why it was written. Um, yes, I'll answer that. I'll try to answer that question today. But we will try to answer the question today. Okay, you. so you're welcome, Madam Hamlet. Somebody wanted to say Madam, something? Yes, Madam Ali. Madam, so this, uh, these books being uh, a sort of anthology. So the writers the, wrote their, each one wrote their part or whatever. And so the redactor, he just smoothed it all over. He crocheted them all together to make them read right. Correct. So, so that they would read sort of, they'd read well, like a novel. And that they didn't have to be historically or accurate or any of that. He just wanted them to read well. Yes. Got it. Right. Yeah, like um, Mr. Drew writes, it's part of the Noah's Ark. You write yours. I write mine. Mr. Jason comes later, notices that, hey, there are three works. Stitches them together. <laughs> <laughs> and presented as one work written by Moshe. Like, wait a second. <laughs> wow. Yes. So now what we're doing is, okay, I want to see what Madame Alita wrote, what her concerns were, when she wrote, why she wrote. I want to do the same with um, Mr. Drew. I want to do the same thing with Aquite and see if they're saying the same thing. What are their concerns? And then you would see where everyone is coming from, their concerns, why they are writing. It's, it's beautiful. Rabbi, Mr. CJ, I don't know if you know the answer to this question, but I'm wondering, did Gilgamesh have an ark story? Did he take um, animals? And how many did he take if he did? Yeah, um, there was there was an ark. There were sacrifices. Um, they're getting it from Gilgamesh. Whatever they took. No, let me not say that. Um, let me say J is getting it from Gilgamesh, I would say. And then E is trying to push his narrative as well. So instead of Noah, instead of Utnapishtim, which is from the Gil Epic of Gilgamesh, you know, that that's uh, uh, I don't think anybody will call their child Utnapishtim today. It's too long. Let's make it Noah. You know? <laughs> that's my take on it. But yes, there, there, there is an art. Dimensions are given, sacrifice is given, all of that. Rabbi, this is, this is, um, oh my God, this is so interesting. Um, you notice that these names are all Canaanite. Oh, yes, they are. When you start digging, like Peniel, Israel. Yeah. Even Aaron, Penny has the Egyptian names. Yeah, they're Egyptian, but oh. Jeroboam is is a is a name of like disrespect. That's not a dignity name. Like it, it means that he opposes the people. Correct. You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. 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 Jeroboam and Rehoboam, you know, play on names oh, in the north, names. north and south. <laughs> wow! Wow! Okay, awesome. So now we see the territory and their concerns. Now let's move forward and do Jacob at Bethel. Um, we're going to read the narrative, going to separate the J source from the E source. What I want to say about the E source is that anything that is not highlighted is the E source. Anything that is not highlighted is the E source. Anything that is highlighted in pink is the J source. Let's look at Jacob at Bethel. Let's read the J source first. We're gonna start from verses 10, Genesis 28. 
And Jacob left Beersheba, and he went to Haran. And he arrived at the place and lodged there because the sun had set. Sorry, uh, I, I didn't break the set. 13. And behold, Yudhe was standing over him. And he said, I am Yudhe Vavhe, the, the God of the El of Abraham, your father, and the El of or the power. In, 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 in the J, when J uses God, it's not Elohim, it's just power. Okay, so let's start from the top again. And Jacob left Bathsheba and he went to Haran and he arrived at the place and lodged there because the sun has set. 13. And behold, Yudhevavhe was standing over him and he said, I am Yudhevavhe, the power of Abraham, your father, and the power of Isaac, the land upon which you are lying, to you I would, I would give it and to your seed. And your seed shall be as the dust of the earth and you shall gain strength westward, eastward, northward, southward, and through you shall be blessed all the families of the earth and through your seed. And behold, I am with you and I will guard you wherever you go and I'll restore you to this land for I will not forsake you until I have done what I have spoken concerning you. And Jacob awoke from his sleep and he said, Indeed, Yudhe is in this place and I did not know it. 19. And he named the place Bethel, but Luz was originally the name of the city. Okay. This is the J source. J tells us how Bethel was named, got his name, and um, what happened with Jacob at Bethel. Let's read the E source. Okay. And he took some of the stones of the place and placed them at his head, and he lay down in that place. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the ground, and its top reached to heaven. And behold, angels of Elohim were ascending and descending upon it. 17. And he was frightened and he said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of Elohim. And this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob arose early in the morning and he took the stone that he had placed at his head and he set it up as a monument and he poured oil on top of it. And Jacob uttered a vow saying, if Elohim will be with me and he will guard me on this way upon which I am going and he will give me bread to eat and a garment to wear. And if I return in peace to my father's house and you'd have will be my Elohim. I will make that comment here. I'll leave it down. <laughs> then the stone, which I have placed as a monument, shall be a house of Elohim. And everything that you give me, I will surely tithe to you. I'll make this statement. Both sources, J and E, tell stories about the city of Bethel. And both kingdoms, Judah and Israel, they, they're making political claims on Bethel, which was the border between them. Okay. Bethel is the border between these two kingdoms. Put that in your spirit. Judah has told us where, how the name came about. Israel is going to tell us his. Okay. So, Jacob makes a promise that if you take me, you bring me back, this is what um, is going to happen. This is what I'm going to do. Okay. Now we go to Genesis 35. I want to continue with the Bethel narrative. Okay. And Elohim said to Jacob, Arise and go up to Bethel and abide there. 
and make there an altar to Elohim, who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So he's coming back. He's, he ran away. He's done. He's dealt with Laban. He's coming back. Therefore, Jacob said to his household and to all those who were with him, remove the deities of the foreign nations which are in your midst. Purify yourself and change your clothes. And we, will, and we will arise and go up to Bethel. And I will make an altar to the Elohim who answered me on the day of my distress and was with me on the way that I went. And they gave Jacob all the deities of the nations that were in, his, in their possessions earrings that were in their ears and Jacob hid them under the terebinth that was near Shechem. Then they traveled and the fear of Elohim was upon the cities that were around them so that they did not pursue Jacob's sons. And Jacob came to Luz, which is in the land of Canaan, that is Bethel, he and all the people who were with him. He built there an altar and he called the place El Bethel. For there Elohim had been revealed to him when he fled from before his brother Esau. Okay. How did the place get its name? According to J, there's a dream. He woke up, there's a dream. Yah promises that this place is going to be their uh, um, abode, the window of heaven, whatever I want to call it, which is supposed to be Jerusalem. Remember that, J has an interest. That is how J tells us Bethel got his name. E disagrees, says no. Jacob, our patriarch, was on a journey he stops there, he has a dream, he makes a vow that if you take me to where I'm going and when I return, I will come here and build you an altar. It's in when he builds the altar that he calls the place of the, uh, he calls the place El Bethel. This is what Jay tell, sorry, E tells us. Okay. Where is Bethel? The text tells us it's in Shechem. What do we know about Shechem? That's Kings 12. And Jeroboam built Shechem. So the e source is correcting the narrative. No, that is not how um, Bethel got its name. You dealing with a northern territory built by the first king of after Saul, Jeroboam, in Shechem. So both sources, J and E, tell stories about the city of Shechem, which Jeroboam built and made the capital of Israel. And in the narrative, it tells us how Bethel got its name. J has a different story. E has a different story. Mr. Jason, go with the question. All right. <laughs> we just read that Jacob supposedly said, you'd hey, Vav, hey, if you would be my L, my power, right? Correct. That was in 21. <laughs> <laughs> Yo. But over here, this is, it's not saying the same thing. Correct. L he, he named the place <laughs> El Bethel. Why is it El Bethel and not Yudhe Wave of Bethel? You see what I'm saying? Like, they're making a clear distinction. And secondly, they didn't, 
they kept the other gods. They just right. took yeah. them yeah. out of L's place. His face. Right. You know? <laughs> they just took them away from where they worship him at. But they kept the other ones. They said they put them away. Oh man. So you see their concerns. Jay, this is a border, it's it's bordered them, you know, J and 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 E. And these are political. They are political statements here. J makes a claim, E corrects the claim. No, this is how Bethel got its name. It was based on the covenant, a vow that our patriarch took, and he um what do you call it? Redeemed the vow. He built the altar, and as we said, he names it El Bethel. Jay says, "No, it was a dream. It's going to the place where he's laying. It's going to be the. Um, let's go back to up uh, to. It's going to be the house. Okay, it, it's going to be the house. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Yes, and um, behold, I will be with you." It's again, and he named the place Bethel, but loses original the name of the city. So it, it's different perspectives, or someone makes a political territorial claim, and then he comes in and says, um, "No, we're talking about the um, northern kingdom um, and the territory of Shechem. This is how Bethel got its name." Rabbi, can I ask a quick question? Yes, please. And it has more to do with um, your position on how this unfolds. If someone came along after these events occurred and redacted and stitched it together, why in the world would they stitch together both stories if Judah was in charge at the time? Why not just go with the J source and the D source? Do you have a position on that? Yes, it's the time that they're stitching it together. Um, they did it with Chronicles. Chronicles was able to just use one person's position to tell a story, took out all the bad stuff. But you couldn't do that with What you call it? You couldn't do that with the sources that you have. Um, the redactor is trying to uh, present all the traditions. Now, if it was a J redactor that was doing it, he could have just removed everything else and just presented us with the the J side of the story. But the redactor stands on its own. No, the president stitching it together um, is not. Uh, I don't think it's J or E. Um, maybe a priest, maybe. That's why they pre they presented us with what Mr. Drew wrote, what Madame Alida wrote, what I wrote, and then Deuteronomy. So, yes, that's that's what I think um, happened, and uh, I think I can, yes. I can demonstrate. Yeah. And I understand exactly what you're saying, and thank you. Part of me is trying to to, decom to um, I guess, decompose this um, this understanding that I have that, um, or the understanding that might be out there that the Torah was kind of put together and penned when after the Babylon after the Babylonian. Um, 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 captivity when they came back and the story that keeps repeating my mind is that when they came back um, Ezra and and his and his people sat down and put everything together and so I always say if that is the case and they were Yahwist why would they include the northern tradition so this is helping me understand that but I still can't I guess I have to put down that Ezra and his gang wrote this when they got back at it, when they got back from exile. That's what I have to put down. Correct, yes, because that's not the case. Um, we have, um, what do you call it? When you look at the political um, and the things that 
I'm mentioning the text, the person writing is familiar with um, from the ninth century all the way to the seventh, uh, um, late seventh century. So uh, you're looking at text, literary text coming before even the Babylonian exile, the Babylonia, Babylonian exile. It's, you have these texts being being formulated. Especially when the south, the north came down to the south, and they would hear traditions about the founder of the dynasty, and they would raise questions, saying, "Well, that's not what we have." You know, that is when you would you would start writing to correct um, or to answer questions, challenges that you're getting from the north, the northern refugees. So. So it would be fair to say that Ezra and his group just added another layer to Correct. whatever. Yep. Thank you. Yep. They, okay. They didn't rewrite it. They just added their their point of view. Their point of view. Correct. Their reforms and things that they they did. Awesome. Thank so, you. You're very welcome. So you see how we've done this beautifully. We've seen what Jay says about Bethel. We see what E says about Bethel. And um, he is focusing on the capital, Shechem, which was built by Jeroboam, with Jeroboam the first. Now, let's go to Shechem. I think there's a beautiful story. Shechem is the capital of the Northern Kingdom. But how did the Northern Kingdom acquire Shechem? J tells a story. E tells a very different one. Let's look at it. We're going to start with a J because J starts the narrative. Genesis 34. We know the story. It's a long one. Let me read it fast. Maybe we can. I'll skip a bit. But the whole of Genesis 34 is, which talks about the episode of Dinah, is a J narrative. It's not an E narrative. It's a J narrative. Let's read it for those who don't remember. Dina, the daughter of Leah, whom she had born to Jacob, went out to look about among the daughters of the land, and Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, the prince of the land, saw her, and he took her, lay with her, and violated her. And his soul was cleaved to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. He loved the girl and spoke to the girl's heart. And Shechem spoke to his father, Hamor, saying, Take this girl for me as a wife. Jacob had heard that he had defiled his daughter, Dinah, but his sons were with his livestock in the field. And Jacob kept silent until they came home. And Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. And Jacob's sons had come from the field when they heard, and the men were grieved. And they burned fiercely because he had committed a scandalous act in Israel to lie with the daughter of Jacob. And, she, and, and such ought not to be done. And Hamor spoke with them saying, My son Shechem, His soul has a liking for your daughter. Please give her to him for a wife and intermarry with us. You shall give us your daughters and you shall take our daughters for yourself and you shall dwell with us and the land shall be before you. Remain, do business there and settle there. And Shechem said to her father, to her brothers, may I find favor in your eyes. Whatever you tell me, I will give. Impose upon me a large marriage settlement and gift, and I will give as much as you ask of me. But give me the girl for a wife. Thereupon, Jacob's sons answered Shechem and his father Hamor with cunning, and they spoke because, after all, he had defiled their sister Dina. And they said to them, We cannot do this thing to give our sister to a man who has a foreskin, for that is a disgrace to us. But with this, however, we will consent to you. If you will be like us, that every male will be circumcised, then we will give you our daughters and we will take your daughters 
for ourselves and we will dwell with you and become one people. But if you do not listen to us to be circumcised, we will take our daughters and go. Their words pleased Hamor and Shechem, the son of Hamor. And the young man did not delay to do the thing because he desired Jacob's daughter. And he was the most honored in all his father's household. And Hamor said, sorry, and Hamor and his son Shechem came to the gate of their city and they spoke to the people of their city saying, these men are peaceful with us and they will dwell in the land and do business there. And the land, behold, it is spacious enough for them. We will take their daughters for ourselves as wives and we will give them our daughters. However, only with this condition will the men consent to dwell with us, to become one people. By every male among us being circumcised, just as they are circumcised, then shall not their cattle, their property, and all their beasts be ours. But let us consent to them, and they will dwell with us. And all those coming out of the gate of his city listened to Hamor and his son Shechem, and every male, all who went out of the gate of his city became circumcised. Now they came to pass on the third day, when they were in pain, that Jacob's two sons, Simon and Levi, Dina's brothers, each took his sword, and they came upon the city with confidence, and they slew every male. And Hamor and his son Shechem, they slew with the edge of the sword, and they took Dina out of Shechem's house and left. Jacob's sons came upon and slain and plundered the city that had defiled their sister, their flocks and their cattle and their donkeys and whatever was in the city and whatever was in the field they took. And all their wealth and all their infants and their wives they captured and plundered and all that was in the house. Thereupon Jacob said to Simon and to Levi, you have troubled me to discredit me among the inhabitants of the land among the Canaanites, parasites, and I am few in number, and they will gather against me and attack me, and I and my household will be destroyed. And they said, shall we make our sisters like a harlot? Awesome. This is Jay telling us how Shechem, the capital of the north, came to be. But you will notice that This is not a very pleasant story of how the Northern Kingdom acquired its capital city. Jay is telling us how Israel acquired its capital city and it's not a very pleasant one. They massacred it. That is how they got it. Okay. <laughs> That's what you tell us. What does the E story tell us about Shechem and how it was acquired? Should I go on? Let's see here. Um, one second here. Please check my, my address. Is it correct? One second. Let me, this is important. So let me correct it if my address is wrong. This is Genesis 34. One second. Sometimes I copy and paste the slide. So, and I forget to change the address at the top. It's not 34. It is, let me see, it is, give me one second, it's not 34, the address is wrong. The, I have to change it because it's important. I'm 33, I think. Yes. 
Genesis that, 33. Okay, let me make that change. It's important I have my addresses correct. The moment I saw it, I noticed that it wasn't 30. It's 33. Let me make the change here. There we go. Awesome. Thank you very much, Mr. Jason. Okay. What does the North tell us about how Shechem was acquired? Well, I guess we have to listen to what the North has to say, the E source. So the R is a redactor. So I'm going to skip the R. I'm just going to read the E source. Genesis 33. Let's start from verse 17. And Jacob traveled to Sukkot and built himself a house. And for his cattle, he made booths. Therefore, he named the place Sukkot. 19. And he bought the part of the field where he had pitched his tent from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for a hundred kisitas. There he erected an altar and he named it. Elohim is the Elohim of Israel. How did the Northern Kingdom of Israel acquire their capital? They bought it. <laughs> oh, Lord have mercy. <laughs> You see the difference? You wouldn't see this till you pull the sources apart. E is telling us that Shechem is our capital built by our King Jeroboam. How did it become our capital? It was purchased. J, who is a rival to the North, says, you know how they got the capital? They massacred the place. So this so is have a what you come about when you do what we do in high criticism where we look at the JPDR sources. Go ahead, Madam Masi. So in that case, I need to ask if necessarily what happened to Dina, did it really happen? According to Jay, that is what happened. E does not agree. <laughs> 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 I mean, it's such a terrible story, you know, why would you, why would you do that? that that's so, that's horrible. Yeah, so Jay has, Jay has the history of, let's say, doing that. Remember what they did to Esau at all? Last week when we read, you know, we make them family members and then make him um, a caveman and... <laughs> Jacob is <laughs> the intellectual. So yes, Jay seems to have the habit of doing that. Wow. Wow. So E says no, it was purchased. Jay says no, you massacred for it. Rabbi? You can literally you can literally split this thing. I, I'm sitting here bewildered and betwixt because I started thinking about Jacob's deathbed distribution of property. Oh, hold and, up. We're coming there. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Bring that one. I didn't not, not bring that one. No. <laughs> what are you going to do with it? <laughs> yep. That's a good point. That's a very good point, my family. We'll look at the distribution, um, the death bed, bed, blessing. Oh, it will shock you. Rabbi, you, this is, this is, this is too much. Um, <laughs> this is, this is, this is too much. Um, <laughs> so, Oh man, I, I can't even find the correct words right now. It's, this is just too much. The, the the Judeans is saying that, oh, they got Shechem by killing everything. Correct. 
but literally David got Jerusalem by killing everything, but they like, nah, he didn't kill everything. Technically, God magically did this stuff all around him. Yes, and we, we know that E source is telling the truth because we looked at that mana lettuce and La Bayou was of Shechem. That was his territory. And he tried to um, move up to the other territories by forming alliance. You know, so when, when did, I mean, Shechem had always been the base where the expansion is happening. So if I'm supposed to choose from, you know, the evidence that we have, it wasn't no Dina. I can't buy that narrative. The E narrative makes more sense based on the historical data that we have and that we've examined. If, if the Dina story is correct, how did they get out of that? Like, you got to think, Jacob, Jacob is just a traveler, right? Correct. Like, and he's in this man's land and he does all this stuff. There is no way a, a 12 kids is going to be able to do that to an entire kingdom. Like, it's just, it's just not realistic. It doesn't make any sense. Correct. And then to mention her name, you know, to, to really pinpoint and say it was Dina, it's, yeah. It's problematic, but yeah, the two sources disagree. It's terrible. It's a terrible thing. <laughs> My goodness. The two sources disagree. Okay, uh, Mr. Herbert asked the question. He said, did Jacob buy land in a city area of Shechem or did he purchase the city called Shechem? No, so... um It says he bought the part of the field where he had pitched his tent from the son of Hamor, the father of Shechem. So he bought a piece of the land of Shechem. So according to the e source, and I explained what the e source is doing. Um, the e source is not given as a hundred percent historical account. It's correcting the J. It's setting the record straight. You know, there there may be some truth to what the E source is saying, but he has to fashion what he's saying based on the standard that the J rider has set. I explain that very soon. But, um, so he could have just bought a piece of land or he could have just bought the whole land. 